the Prophet وسلم, he made Hijrah from Mecca Al Mukarramah to Medina Al Manawara after 13 years of calling to Islam in Mecca. So he spent 13 years in the city of Mecca uh, receiving revelation, calling people to Islam, guiding people, teaching people. And then after 13 years, after a lot of challenges and difficulties, permission was given and the Muslims started to migrate and move and leave. You know, they, they were going to not, they were not sure if they were going to come back. There was no guarantees. Of course, you know, the Prophet had revelation and the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but as a Muslim, as an everyday person, you know, it's a challenge. You see the realities of the struggle, of the persecution. And so they left their homes, they, they, they left their homeland, their families who were not Muslim, and they moved to Medina. So the Muslims that left Mecca for Medina, they were called the Muhajirin or the Muhajirun, right? Muhajir, a emigrant, somebody who leaves the land and settles elsewhere. And the people of Medina, they were called the Ansar. Ansar means helpers. Nasr is a helper, Ansar are helpers. Those who aided and helped the Prophet ﷺ and the emigrants when they came to Medina. So the people of Medina, the Muslims that supported the Prophet ﷺ, are the Ansar, and the Muslims that migrated to Medina and lived there, leaving behind Mecca, are the Muhajirin, Muhajirun. Now, it's important, and the reason why I'm mentioning all of this, is to understand the journey of a Muslim, you know, how Muslims developed over these, you know, the, how the Prophet ﷺ trained up the Muslims, how he nurtured them, what was the journey of Islam and a Muslim in that time, and that therefore is a lesson for us, an example for us, that this is what we need to be looking out for, this is what we need to be following and, and practicing, and, you know, having as our strategy or you know, methodology. And that was, the Prophet ﷺ didn't establish a system or an organization or a government or a lot of rules even in those 13 years of Mecca. But when he arrived in Medina, وسلم, he did. And the rules came thick and fast. Rules about prayer, about fasting, about zakat, about commerce, about marital laws, about you know, uh, international affairs as it's called, or jihad as some of you like to call it, um, or seer is called in the books of uh, um, uh, fiqh, uh, and other laws, you know, inheritance laws, uh, and so forth. There's many, many areas, but a whole system, judicial law, what happens if there's an argument, or if there's a claim over land, and all of these things. A whole system was set up, a government system, dealing with all sorts of international communications, like we said, and other things as well, you know, imports, uh, imports, exports, everything. There was a law for all of these, and books have been written in detail about this. But this didn't occur when the Prophet received a revelation in Mecca in the cave of Hira. This didn't occur in the first five years of revelation. Uh, this didn't occur under, you know, the Muslims that were the greatest of Muslims because they were the ones following the Prophet. Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Uthman, Sayyidina Ali, in Mecca. It happened when they traveled to Medina. In other words, there was a different setting and a different stage for the Muslims and these people to uh, deliver, to, to move on to. But that was only allowed or possible with the platform of the 13 years before. So what I really want to talk about is those 13 years. Because we always want, we always want to get to the end of the hood. You know, we want to be great, for our glory days and so forth. But we forget how that occurs or where that comes from. I remember a long time ago, maybe 15, maybe about, I think yeah, about 15 years ago, I remember I attended a lecture in England by Sheikh Muhammad Ali Yaqubi, one of the first times I attended his lectures. And he said, you know, we make dua that oh Allah give us victory in Palestine, in Kashmir, in these places, right? The Muslims are being persecuted and may Allah give grant us victory, yes. But he said this is maybe the, not the right dua. I was like, what was the right dua then? Right? Are we not supposed to ask for victory? And he said, we should make the dua, O oh Allah, make us worthy of victory. O oh Allah, make us people who will be given victory in this time, or victory will be on our hands. Because he said, I remember the Sheikh saying, victory is guaranteed for the Muslims. Like we said, the revelation is there, the Prophet told us what's going to happen. You know, we believe that's our Iman, we're not going to doubts in this. 
But we always think, yeah, it's not going to be yours, it's going to be the people after them. Mm-hmm. They're probably going to see the victories here. Maybe our children, grandchildren, we always pray like this. But what was the Sheikh saying? He was saying, make the dua that we all become worthy. We might not still see the victory, but are we even worthy of this? Do we deserve to be given victory in the current state of affairs as individuals, as communities, as countries and societies, etc.? So this is why I'm talking about these 13 years, because I feel and I see and we all kind of see that we want glory, we want success. Everybody wants everything in life. You know, people want millions of pounds, but they don't don't want to work for it. They want an easy life and just, you know, chill at home. But they don't understand it takes hard work to move forward in life, right? And we need to understand these 13 years. And I'm not going to go into too much detail and go over 13 years of the seerah. You should start learning and reading and studying, attending courses on the seerah, the life of the Prophet ﷺ. I just want to mention a few, you know, bullet points, a few important stages or uh, elements of that whole 13 years, inshallah ta'ala. So the question arises, if it wasn't laws and it wasn't rules in a government system, what was it then? What was going on in those 13 years? And if you look at the foundation of it all, it was iman. Okay, it was beliefs. It was, you know, belief in Allah and the angels, yes. Belief in the messengers, belief in the books. If you look at the revelation, it was a lot of stories of the previous prophets. The story of Musa salam, and Isa salam, and Ibrahim salam. And we recite these stories in our salah. You probably hear the name of Ibrahim and Musa salam the most because they're the two oft mentioned prophets in the Quran and Isa salam sometimes and other prophets, Ayyub salam, Ya'qub salam. The whole uh, chapter on Yusuf salam's beautiful story, Ahsan al Qasas, the best of narratives. And all of these stories were related. For the Prophet and the Muslims to understand the struggle is going to take to get to success. The Prophets before you struggled and you're going to struggle. The Prophets before you and their people were persecuted and harmed and killed and this is going to be the journey. Some of you will make it, some of you will be martyred. And these are shuhada, it's a great thing. You're taken as witnesses, as martyrs by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they were being trained up and taught and finding a firm belief that we will get to success. But there will be sacrifices on the way, there will be struggles on the way. And they accepted that, you know, they embraced that. They didn't shy away from it and say, oh, it's too hard, I think I'll stay at home and not take part. Which is kind of what we do today. Oh, is that what it requires to be a Muslim? Oh, it's a bit too hard for me and I'll stay at home, you know, trawi or charity or whatever it is that is asked of us. We seem to hesitate, you know, we seem to not be as competent or as, you know, uh, passionate as the actual real Muslims were, the Sahaba and at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam their, their willingness to sacrifice to give, to obey the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and do what it takes was second to none, you know, that's what made them the greatest and that's why we could never oh if I was there, if I was a Sahabi we say this, right, no we would have failed miserably right, so Alhamdulillah we're in this time Alhamdulillah, Allah there's good in all the Ummah, I'm not trying to say we're bad what I'm trying to say is we need to improve definitely and we need to learn that basic foundation of Iman. And the sad thing is, we don't know that. You know, I mean, we haven't read a simple book like Aqidah Tahawiya, which you know, outlines the basic articles of faith we have. We haven't practiced that faith, or we haven't built that faith by you know, doing regular dhikr and Quran, and you know, just practicing Islam, being in good company, you know, making the trips to Makkah, Medina for uh, Umrah and for Ziyarah. These all help with building the Iman, you know, all these acts of worship. Ramadan is here, we're fasting, this is the idea to build our Iman and strength and, and our sacrifice and love for this religion. Because it's the truth, because what the Prophet ﷺ brought removed falsehood. He got rid of the shirk and the idols and people worshipping other people and people being subdued and subjugated and humiliated by other people and by doing silly things. Literally, they were doing tawaf naked and they were bound down to pieces of rock and stones and and they, they had no intellect, they were lost, you know, they were uh, just so misguided, right? And the light of Islam came, the light of Iman came and showed them the way. And they turned, a lot of them were doing that, you know, but they changed from that. And they embraced Tawheed and they embraced uprightness and virtues and those characteristics that they embraced are what we need. So after the Iman uh, and alongside the Iman, it was morals and values, akhlaq. So there was, like I said, they were ready to sacrifice. I, they were ready to be patient, have sabr. You know, we can't have sabr for two minutes these days, right? We lose, you know, control. We lose our cool over one word, one sentence, or one little thing happens to us. You know, they were people of immense 
sabr, patience. Uh, they were people of, you know, truth. You know, this 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 truth, truth and trustworthiness to be sure, who the Prophet ﷺ was. But this is what he inculcated in the Muslims. You know, they were upright people. They wouldn't cheat anybody. They wouldn't lie. They wouldn't deceive. You know, the Prophet said that the one who keeps telling the truth and adhering to the truth and his tongue's firmly on the truth, that will take him to paradise. Until he's, it actually says, he will be written with Allah as Siddiq. That's the highest rank. After the Prophets, then Biya is the Siddiqiyya. Said Abu Bakr is Siddiq. Constant truthfulness. Telling the truth, adhering to the truth, speaking the truth. You will be written in the Allahi Siddiqa. You will have paradise, but where will you be in paradise? With the Siddiqin, right at the top. This is the virtue and importance of having truthfulness on our tongues. And this is really what virtue is, you know, manliness is, you know, what real stature is. It's not having the muscles or just having an appearance of a man or a, you know, strong person, let's say. It's, it's really having the strong characteristics to stand for something of value, of moral, of, of truth. And then this is the kind of honesty and trustworthiness. Now, look at today. We just had coronavirus and who knows what fraud, how, you know, let's, let's be honest, right? The Muslims were doing or the whole government was doing and everybody was doing, but it's become the norm and we just let it go by. We don't care anymore. Well, they did it, so what? Forget about it, move on, you know, with new, new, clean slate, just move on. We think that's it, just, you know, we can move on and forget about things. No, what has it done to our morals and values? What are the people like now after those two years? Are we better and more moral and upright or have we actually lost a bit of that morality? We got a bit worse because we don't care, because we have this, you know, laid back attitude towards these very serious, you know, contraventions of morals and principles, let alone the law, that's that's secondary to us. What's primary is the morals and values which are in line with that law, which are, you know, what, what we actually stand for the law for. You know, the whole law is there to keep us upright and, and, and on the right path. I'm talking about our Islamic virtues and laws, right? And this is where the Muslims are very strong. You know, they didn't waver in following the laws and commands. You know, they actually, this ayah was actually revealed in Surah Baqarah because of the first part of the ayah. It says, whether you show what you do or you hide what you do, Allah will take you to account. So the Muslims got scared like, this is too hard on Messenger of Allah. We can't do this. The Prophet said, don't say what the people before you said. Sami'na We hear and we disobey. Right, don't say that. Say, Sami'na wa ata'na. We hear and we obey. Ghufran, we ask for your forgiveness. It's too, you know, it's too hard, but we we'll obey, we'll still try. Ghufranaka, and we ask for your forgiveness. Yeah? Rabbana wa alaykum masir, and to you, to you is our return. And then the next ayah was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La yukallifullahu nafsan illa wusaha. Allah does not burden a soul more than it can bear. And Allah forgives you, has mercy on you, and Allah taught us a dua at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, showing his mercy and kindness to us. But this is the attitude that سَمِعْنَا وَاطَعْنَا Even when it seems too difficult, the Sahaba were taught by the Prophet ﷺ, don't say, we hear and we can't do it. We hear and we disobey like the people before you did to Musa al Islam or the Prophets. No, say سَمِعْنَا وَاطَعْنَا We hear and we obey. If that's the command, we've heard the command, we are going to obey and follow this command. This was the commitment of the Muslims. In one ayah of the Quran, the ayah means, that if you were to command the companions to kill themselves or to leave their homes, not many of them would have done this. You know, out of obedience to you and sacrifice and following the laws of Islam. The people before, they had to kill themselves. You might think, oh, kill yourself. How's that allowed in Islam? In the people of Bani Israel, uh, they had to kill themselves. فَقَتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ And you kill yourselves. That's, that was their tawbah. They had to kill themselves as part of the Tawbah process. That's it, it's over. Right? So this is the how you know one the previous laws were. Allah is saying if you say that to them now, the Sahaba will do it. But you know, not everyone would have done that, right? So there's these were very, very unique people, very, very, you know, willing people who submitted to Islam. That's what Islam is. Aslam to Lillahi Rabbil Alameen. I've surrendered to Allah, the Lord of the world. This is the way of Ibrahim al-Islam, the way of the Prophet. And that's what we need to find and, and, and grow in our lives, right? And develop in our lives. And that's why we need to look at the 13 years of Makkah. Before we start saying, I want to achieve this, I want to achieve that. Have we got those 13 years? Have we worked on ourselves? And if it, it was 13 years for the Sahaba, it might, might take us 20 years, 25 years. But don't give up. Prophet ﷺ was 40 when he started and he was in his 50s when he went to Medina. 
right? So don't worry that we got it now. I'm, I'm in my thirties now. Don't worry that there's time. There's time, right? Thirteen years, okay. Twenty years, okay. When Prophet went to Medina, it went exponential. Why? Because he was prepared. It grew very quickly. You know, the Ansar were ready. Even the Ansar were prepared, by the way. They didn't just, when the Prophet arrived, were ready to serve him. The Prophet was speaking to them and their people for two, three years before he migrated. The three times in Aqaba, he met them. So Allah, so there was a few first time, a handful. The third time, there was over 70. And each time they went back to teach their people, the Prophet sent somebody from the Muslims in Makkah, two people. Musab ibn Umair uh, and uh, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum uh, to Medina to teach the Quran, to teach them the deen, to teach them Islam and the prayer, etc. So there was preparations going on and this is all, and that preparation wasn't these are the laws and what we're going to follow. No, this is Iman. What had been taught to the Muslims in Mecca was now being passed on to the Muslims in Medina and you can see at the core of it was the Quran. The recitation of the Quran, the learning of the Quran, the, and the adherence to those values because the Quran tells us about the afterlife it tells us about attributes of Allah it tells us about the morals and the virtues and the values and when those and it was their language of course so when they had an attachment and a love for this book they had an attachment and love and a passion to follow that book and that's what we need to revive and that's why inshallah when we teach our children not only do we teach them the recitation of the Quran we want them to also understand the importance of following the Quran and the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet because the Quran says Follow the Prophet ﷺ, follow those in authority, follow the, you know, the, the, the Sahaba, etc. So may Allah give us tawfiq to build ourselves and reflect, like I said, I can't teach you, I can't do a full you know, lecture on the 13 years of Makkah. But what we can do, and I hope you can do, is read about that, is pick up a sirah book, is to watch a lecture, listen to a lecture, talk about it with each other. You know, there's some great events that occurred in Ramadan. Although they were, they were the Medinan phase, there were great events that occurred, the Battle of Badr, the conquest of Makkah. Um, you know, the whole life of the Prophet ﷺ must be studied and read by all Muslims. Every single Muslim should learn more about the Prophet ﷺ, more about the whole journey of Islam, because that's what the seerah is. You see Islam when you, you, read, you, you, you see the seerah, the life, the Bible of the Prophet ﷺ. And to think you know Islam without knowing about him and his life and what happened, trust me, it, you know nothing. You know absolutely nothing about Islam if you think what you learned from, you know, your childhood and hearsay and a few lectures here and there but without knowing the seerah, the life of the Prophet you cannot truly understand what Islam is and what, what is the religion you follow right? so you owe it to yourself more than anybody else to learn the seerah to figure out who you are, who, who your Prophet is, what, what, what it's all about